Ms. Olson, you're still under oath. Yes. Go ahead, Mr. Martin. Thank you. Ms. Olson, I want to take you back to a, a point in time in the direct examination when you were discussing with Mr. Michaels um, that Mr. Reeves uh, stood up, uh, walked down the aisle, you saw him go down the stairs, uh, and then he returned. Okay, that's the segment that okay. I want to talk about now. Now, when Mr. Reeve stood up after telling your husband that he was going to go and uh, talk to the manager and you explained to us uh, your husband's response, do what you have to do, worse without a fact. Mm -hmm. um, you indicated to us that uh, Mr. Reeves uh, walked off down the aisle, right? Yes. Right. As Mr. Reeves was walking down the aisle, your husband never turned to you and had any more comments about Mr. Reeves, did he? Not a word. He didn't say anything about, if that guy brings back the manager, I'm going to kick his butt or anything like that, right? Absolutely not. Uh, based on your observations of Mr. Olson, your husband, as Mr. Reeves was walking down the aisle, would you agree that he just ignored him? Absolutely. All right. Now, while Mrs. Mr. Reeves was gone, did your husband ever turn around and have any comments with Mrs. Reeves? No. She, he never turned around and, and talked to her at all? No. <clears throat> you indicated, and then we're in the same segment, that Mr. Reeves returns, uh, and he makes a comment worse to the fact, I see you put your phone away now, I wouldn't have reported you to the manager. So from that, that's the segment I want to talk okay. about. All right. So now he's gone, and you don't know if he, Mr. Reeves said that, if he was sitting or standing, right? I don't recall. All right. But after he made that, uh, your husband turned in his seat and said something to Mr. Reeves. Correct. All right. <clears throat> and after he said something to Mr. Reeves, you explained that your husband stood up. Yes. All right. Now I want to talk about stood up. When we talk about, uh, you said your husband stood up and was standing, you mean he was out of his seat? He was out of his seat, yes. Right. I'm going to take you segment by segment. You already told us that you did not witness uh, your husband uh, reaching and grabbing a popcorn and tossing the popcorn, right? I did not. All right. So it begs the question, then, you would agree that if you didn't see that, you don't know your husband's position when he did that. You don't know if he was standing straight up. He's six foot, six four? Approximately, All yes. Right. You don't know if he was crouched down, right? <laughs> you don't know if he had a knee in the seat? No. You don't know how he did it, what his body position was when that occurred? That's correct. All right. So when you say he stood up and he was standing, what you're telling us, he was, he was not sitting seat. in his seat? He was out of his seat, correct. Right. You're not implying that the entire time that he was standing fully upright, six foot four, plus whatever his shoes are? That's correct. Okay. <clears throat> Now I want to talk about your intentions as far as reaching and touching your husband, okay? Okay. All right. Now you had that discussion with Mr. Michaels, and uh, you indicated that your intention was to reach over and touch him, right? Yes. All right. And you did that with your left hand, did you not? I did, yes. And you reached straight across your body with your left hand, did you not? I did. All right. And okay, just like you just showed us, your hand kind of parallel to the floor? That's correct. Okay. And you did this as your buttocks was coming out of your seat. Yes. All right. So it was a fluid motion. You're coming out of your seat and you're reaching over. Correct. All right. 
Now, as you are doing that, you don't know your husband's position as you were reaching over, right? Other than he was out of his seat. He was out of his seat and facing. All right. You facing have no backwards. idea, like we said, he's down low, knee in the seat, <coughs> thighs up against the chair. You don't know his position from here to here. No, I don't. All right. The only thing that you know is when you reached over and the shot was fired, you were struck with the same bullet that went into his chest and killed him, right? Yes. No further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just, you know. uh, we can agree that, that currently you have a civil suit pending against Cobb Theater? Yes. Thank you. Nothing else. May this witness be released? No, Your Honor. She will remain under state subpoena. Same way that your facts have been. All right. Um, she's welcome to remain in the courtroom as before, correct? Yeah, we waived that. All right. And this whole Thank you. Free to have a seat. Um, you're still under subpoena. <clears throat> Who's next? The defense calls Mr. Wolf. It's not new information for the court that it's been a long week, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Please say your name. My name is Alan Wayne Wolf. And could you spell your first and your last name for the court reporter, please? A L L E N W O L F E. All right. Now you're going to have to speak up. I know that the prosecutors had some problems hearing some of the witnesses, and so have we, frankly. So sit close to the microphone or pull the microphone a little closer, but not too close because people have been breathing in it, and that's kind of difficult to listen to as well. Um, now, what do you what do you do for a living, Mr. Wolf? I cook for a living. Okay. And where, where are you a cook at? I currently work out uh, IHOP in Day City. And um, you graduated from high school? Yes. Now, let's go right to the, the movie theater on January 13th of 2014, okay? Okay. Now, did you go to see a matinee that day? Yes. And what movie was playing? Lone Survivor. Now, um, do you, are you the kind of guy that likes to get to the theater early, or do you get in the last minute? I usually go early. So tell me what happened when you got to the theater that day. You buy your ticket, what do you do next? I go to the session saying, get some drink, uh, some nachos. Okay, so this day you, you chose to get nachos and a cold drink, right? Yes. And then you go where? I go to my, go to my theater, pick my seats, my seat. Now, through this whole thing, you, you got to know who Mr. and Mrs. Olson are, right? Yes. And so in relation to them, where were you sitting? I'm diagonal to them. I'm like one row below them. Okay. So you're the next row down, right? Yeah. And you're saying diagonal, so what, over your right shoulder? Yes. And who's over your right shoulder, Mr. or Mrs. Olson? Mrs. Olson first. And um, do you talk to them at all? Yes. All right. You strike up a conversation? Uh, I'll chat. When you get to the movie theater, is there anything playing on the screen? Uh, there's some music going right now at the time. And then um, they have these little first take, I think, comes on after that. Well, what, what is that, like an advertisement? Yeah. Um, and, 
and at some point um, after your conversation, do the preview start? Yes. And um, tell me what it's like when the previews are on. What's the lighting like? Is it dark? It was still light. The light was still on. It has started going down yet. All right. And so it's not total dark. Is there some lighting? Yes. And uh, do you remember what preview was playing? Not really. <laughs> All right. Was it loud? Not really. Well, it's a preview. Yeah. It, it was, to me, is about average to me. <laughs> like an average preview? Yeah. Okay. Um, but loud, louder than I'm talking, for instance. Yes. And that's why you go to the movie probably to hear things loud. Do you agree with that? Or yeah. Disagree? Okay. Now, at some point in this whole thing, you get up um, and go back to the concession stand. Is that true? Yes. Get something to drink. Right, because you have one of those refillable giant cups. Yes. <laughs> All right. And uh, when you come back, um, tell me about that. You walk down the aisle. Walk down the aisle. I uh, hear people talking. And do you see anybody using their phone? Oh, yes. <laughs> do you see Mr. and Mrs. Olson using their phone? At the time, yes. Okay. Um, and now, once you sit down, um, did you hear anything unusual, any loud voices? Not at that moment, no. All right. So when you sit down initially, everything is normal? Yeah. And the previews are start to play? Yes. And then, do you hear a loud voice? Yes. Tell us about that. I hear someone yelling in the background, getting louder. Could you tell who sa who's saying that? I don't know. Somebody ordered me at the time. Okay. And was it Mr. Olson or who was it? Uh, Mr. Olson. Okay. And how do you know it was Mr. Olson that was saying those loud words? This is, I turned to look where it was going and I could hear him yelling. And why did you turn to look? Well, I hear somebody say cuss words and use that turn. And I know you're in court and I can tell by the way you say cuss words, you probably don't use them like I do. But it's important that you tell the, yes. the court, you tell the judge, what it is you heard. So to the best of your recollection, tell us what you heard. I said, shut the fuck up. I'm trying to text my, my daughter. Okay. Now at that point, are you facing the screen? Oh no, I'm turned. You're what? I'm turned like this, getting ready to go up, to stand up. And why are you getting ready to go up? Well, you can hear people get start yelling, you know, something brewing. <laughs> okay, but you said people. Do you only hear one voice? Multiple people talking. But you only hear one person yelling, is that yeah. what you're describing? Yes. And um, so what do you do next? I'm going to sit in my seat for a little bit, then get up. I start getting ready to get up. And um, when you get up, do you see anybody standing in the theater when you start to get up? Oh, yes. Mr. Olson was standing. And which way was Mr. Olson facing? Um, towards turn around the seat. You know how turn around and you get up and turn around and face okay. somebody. And, and it's hard. It's hard to because this lady here in front oh, of you. Oh, sorry. You've been doing a wonderful job. The lady in front of you is <laughs> taking down every word on that little machine. Okay. So when you make the hand motions, it's difficult. I, I, I basically someone getting up and turn around and confronting somebody. So and that person was who? Mr. Olson. So Mr. Olson was standing up, and you say turn around. Is he turned all the way around facing the back wall? Yes. And do you hear Mr. Olson say anything? Repeat the same statement, customers. Uh, keep on repeating the same phrase. Could you hear anybody from the row behind Mr. Olson saying anything? Not audibly. But I know somebody was talking to him. And how do you know that? I could hear <coughs> phrases like put the phone down or something like that. Okay. Now, do you remember um, giving a deposition, in other words, coming in with a court reporter? Yes. And um, do you remember you swore to tell the truth? Yes. And um, the date of that was, let me see, March 23rd of 2014. Yep. Um, Day after my dad's birthday. 
Do you remember that? Yeah. The, um, do you remember I spoke to you? Yes. And I told you, when I ask you questions, if, if you're not 100% sure, don't answer the question. Yes. You remember that conversation? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Judge, I'd like to have an opportunity to view that deposition and make sure whether or not if he's trying to impeach him and see whether the statement's consistent or inconsistent. Okay, you'll get the opportunity. I'm sure he's about to announce where he's at. Page. You don't have the deposition yet, Judge. Oh, I'll show them the, the page, Your Honor. It's page 41, line 6 through 9. If I can see the page, I'll, I'll let me show them. Page Olson, right? Yes. And I was talking about the fellow in the back row. Oh, yeah. Mr. Yes. Reeves. Answer, that part I didn't hear because Mr. Olson was getting loud. Yes, that's true. Okay. So, do you do you agree with that as being the truth then? Yes. That you didn't hear the fellow in the back row at all? Object to leaving. Okay. Do you agree that that's the truth? Yes. And so that the, the statement you made in court here previously, that was a misrecollection. Yes. Okay. Now, um, <coughs> at that point, can you see Mrs. Olson? Yes. And what is she doing? Basically, trying to. She had her hands, kind of like you know, trying to calm people, calm her husband down. I'm. Not sure her position her hands. I don't know if she had her hands like like this, like holding her hands up near just up on the body part, going towards the chest, probably. Okay. So you, sure. you have her hands going where? Um, try to position myself. Yes. Okay. Let's say that. Yeah, like, may I judge? Just to help him out a little bit. Mm -hmm. All right. Come on down here a second, boy, please. No, wait. <laughs> it's okay, don't be going. Stand over here if you want. All right, now you're Mrs. Olson, okay? We'll get you a chair. Go ahead and sit down. Okay. All right. And where's Mr. Olson standing at this point? Right here, right. like. He's on this side. Yeah, if you Okay. Right. Now what is she doing? My desk. Okay. Like, you know, so I try to calm somebody down. Your attention at that point, where was your attention? Let me ask you that way. Pretty much on Mr. Olson, Mrs. Olson, probably. Well, Olson. pretty much or everything? Oh, everything. Oh, no. Okay. Now, at some point, uh, do you actually stand up? Yes. And what do you do? Pretty much, I stand up. I start walking toward where Mr. Olson. Well, pretty much, he's standing up, and that's where the sh shots fired, and that's all. And why did you stand up? 
fights getting ready to break out, I'm try to break it up like most anybody else would. And um, was it something in, in Mr. Olson's voice that made you think he was about to fight? Objection, Judge calls for speculation on the part of this witness. All sustained. Can was Mr. Olson's voice loud or soft? Oh, he's loud. And uh, was he cussing? Yes. More than once? Yes. And did he continue to be loud? Yes. Did that make you think that a uh, fight was about to start? Yes. Now, at some point, um, the police got there, and uh, did they hand you a form to tell you to write down what you knew? Yes. And did that first police officer tell you not to talk to anyone? Not aware of. Okay. Later on, did somebody tell you that? Yes. But initially, when you had the form, they didn't tell you that, did they? No. Now, let me show you something. <coughs> That day, you said you got a voluntary statement form, I guess it's called, right? Yes. And um, you already testified, the police officer asked you to fill it out. Did you do that? Yes. And did you sign it? Yes. Let me show you um, something that's titled voluntary statement form. Take a look at it. I'm sorry, Judge, I didn't ask me. I probably jumped here already. <laughs> um, sorry. All right, take a look at that, Mr. Wolf. You recognize that? Yes. Okay. Now read it over. If you would, please. And is that your signature at the bottom? Mm, yes, yes. Okay. Read it over. Take a second. When he was speaking of the old guy, he said it was Chad Olson, referring because Chad, uh, apparently to him, Chad was older than him. So <coughs> by showing him the written statement, I mean, the, the written statement is not in evidence. He's already clarified it, so I don't understand what what are we trying to accomplish here by this line of question. Well, Judge, I didn't, I didn't know the state was, was going to agree to, to accept that without further explanation. So at this point, I'll reserve any, any further um, taking of testimony depending on what the state's cross is. All right? All right, man. You had a chance to read it? Oh, yes, sir. Okay. <coughs> the, uh, 
the uh, guy that you're talking about in that statement, who is that? No, oh, um, Mr. Olson. On January 13th of 2014, you <clears throat> went to the Cobb Theater? Yes, sir. In fact, you went there to watch The Lone Survivor, correct? Yes, sir. Do you know what time you arrived? Um, I'm not really sure, honestly. I'm not sure. Okay. Were you with anyone? No, by myself. Do you know what time you purchased the tickets? It was definitely at least a half hour more earlier. Okay, and uh, do you recall what time the show was starting? I mean, I think 11.30, I'm not really sure. Okay, you're not sure, <clears throat> excuse me, you're not sure about the times? No. Okay. Can you tell us what you did once you got to the theater? Did you, you, you said you went to the concession stand, yes. correct? And you got a Coke? I uh, got a root beer, large root beer, a nacho. Okay. And when you um, arrived in the movie theater, was there a lot of patrons there? Yes, there are some patrons. Okay. Was it, was it full? Was it... How many do you believe? Oh, in the theater itself or inside? In the, the, in the theater itself. Not much. Okay. When you walked into the movie theater, was Mr. and Mrs. Olson already sitting there? Uh, no. <clears throat> Do you know if Mr. Reeves and his wife, Mrs. Reeves, were already sitting there? No. They were not there? No. I was one of the first people there. Okay. Did you notice when Mr. and Mrs. Olson... Um, got into the movie theater? Yes. And do you know how how long after you were in the movie theater that they arrived? Maybe 10, 15 minutes. I'm not really sure. All right. What was, what was the lighting conditions when you were sitting there? Pretty bright. Were the previews on? No. There were okay, so music plays. The previews hadn't even started? Yeah. All right. So Mr. and Mrs. Olsen walk in. And they sit directly behind you, correct? Yeah. One row behind me. Okay. And did you uh, see when Mr. and Mrs. Reeves walked into the movie theater? Yes. That's when the theater started to fill up. Okay. And you would agree with me, would you not, that at this point in time, the lights, you can see people, right? You can see oh, yeah. people walking in. You can see people moving around. You can see people drinking their, their sodas. Yes. Eating popcorn. So on and so forth, right? Do you remember exactly what row you were in? Third <clears throat> row from the top. Well, from the wall, go down the third row from the top. Okay. <clears throat> were you sitting on the end, or where were you in that row? Towards the middle. Towards the middle. And Mr. and Mrs. Olson would have been directly behind you, correct? A uh, couple of seats down, but yes, they were behind me. Okay. <clears throat> and then did you see where Mr. and Mrs. Reeves were? in relation to the Olsons? Yes, they're right behind them. At some point in time, you struck up a conversation with Mr. Olson, correct? Yes. Um, do you remember what you were talking about? The weather, the movie. Just making small talk, small right? Small talk, mostly. OK. Did Mr. Olson have his phone out? Yes. Were the previews on when he had the phone out? No. Okay, so the previews hadn't even started. No. And how do you know, I mean, did you see him with the phone or? I just have, he had his hand, hand off the cell phone in his hand. Okay, could you tell what he was doing with the phone? Texting, mostly texting. You think he was texting, yes. right? Yes. 
You're not absolutely positive that. No, 100%. Okay. At some point in time, the preview start, correct? Yes. Um, did the lights get a little dim? At that moment, no. So you can still see, as the previews are, are on, you can still see in the, in the movie theater, right? Yes. Could you see the person sitting next to you if there was uh, a person there? Oh, yes. About five seats away from you? Yes. Ten seats away from you? Yes. Could you see people walking up the stairs? Yes. Could you see people uh, drinking, <coughs> eating? Yeah. Okay. Are there people talking during the previews? Yes. So there's small talk going on, right? Yeah. And you can hear them? Yes. Above the previews, you can hear people talking. Might right? Leslie here might hear people talking, yes. Okay. Well, you may not understand or hear what they're saying, yes. right? But you can hear this going on. <coughs> yes. And if you would, please, would you tell us when did you notice that there was a problem? Because I think it was some point in time you got up to go to the concession stand, correct? Yes. And there was also a point in time, did you ever see Mr. Reeves get up and walk out of the theater? No, I did not. Do you believe you had gone out of the theater at the same time? I believe so. Okay. When you got back from, I guess, getting a refill, you sat down, correct? Yes. And as you're sitting there, you heard, I believe, what you said was Mr. Olson. Yes. Okay. Prior to that, had you heard Mr. Reeves saying anything to Mr. Olson? Not sure. Right. Isn't it true you heard him saying something to the effect, put the phone away, or you need to put the phone away? Yes. He said not sure. Judge, this is cross-examination. Oh, uh... Did he not tell him, put the phone away? I did hear someone say, put... No, put the, put the phone away. And it wasn't in a nice manner, right? It was in a rude manner. You thought he was rude, didn't you? Oh, yeah. So Mr. Reeves was being rude to Mr. Olson, correct? Correct? Yes. You heard him more than once say put the phone away, correct? Yes. Judge objection, this witness testified earlier that the truth of was that he did not hear Mr. Reeves say anything. And so now what we have is we have the prosecutor harassing this individual. Look at it. The, the prosecutor is harassing this individual, getting him to say what he wants him to say. He may have gotten away with that with Mr. Peck, but judge, we can't allow him to do that with this individual. He testified that he couldn't hear Mr. Reeves. He said it under oath in deposition. He said it under oath here. Judge, I, I appreciate Mr. Michael's objection. However, this is cross-examination, judge, and there's wide latitude. And just because he, he asked him on direct, and said, oh, are you telling the truth? Is this the whole truth? I'm entitled to go into this, Judge. Oh. The question's been asked and answered. That's my objection to this point. I asked him if he heard Mr. Reeves telling him a second time, you need to put the phone away. And she said yes. Oh. Oh. And Mr. Reeves was being rude, wasn't he? Yes. Judge objection. He, he answered first no, and now he asked him again. <coughs> He's getting this poor guy to say yes now. Overall, he said yes to first. And it wasn't until Mr. Reeves kept badgering Mr. Olson that Mr. Olson... Objection to the characterization of badgering. There's been no testimony. Judge, this is cross-examination. I am entitled to ask my questions the way I deem fit. I didn't interrupt Mr. Michaels constantly. Overall, you'll have a chance to redirect. <clears throat> Mr. Wolf, it wasn't until Mr. Reeves kept badgering Mr. Olson that he finally stood up, correct? Tower, I don't, I don't know. Okay. Could have been. At some point in time, Mr. Olson stood up, right? Yes. Was it after you had heard Mr. Reeves telling him, put the phone away, put the phone away? No. Um, I know he <clears throat> stand up and he was cussing. Okay. But when he stood up, was that after Mr. Reeves had confronted him about putting the phone away? Yes, possibly, yes. Okay. Okay. 
Isn't it true that you saw Mr. Olson throw popcorn at Mr. Reeves? Yes. Okay. Isn't it also true you never saw Mr. Olson strike Mr. Reeves? True. Never punched him, correct? Yes. Never hit him? Yes. Never climbed over the chairs? Yes. And immediately after the popcorn is thrown, <laughs> Mr. Reeves pulls out his gun and shoots him, correct? Yes. As this sequence of events is transpiring, you indicated that when Mr. Olson stood up and was cursing, correct? Yes. That Miss um, Olson was in the process of getting up, yes. right? And you indicated for the record that she had put her hand on his chest, correct? Yes. You never saw Mr. Olson climbing over the seats trying to get at Mr. Reeves, did you? No. That never happened, did it? No. And when you indicated to the court that you were watching these events, if you were in the third row, you would agree with me that you would have been, and tell me if, if this is an, ac an accurate representation, <clears throat> you would have been roughly towards the middle, correct? <coughs> Mr. and Mrs. Olson would have been roughly here, yep. right? And then in the back row up against the wall would have been Mr. and Mrs. Reeves, yes. correct? So when you're standing up and you're watching the events, <coughs> you would have been standing here facing, and you said you were facing them, right? Yeah. So you stood up and you're facing directly towards Mr. and Mrs. Olson and Mr. Reeves, yes. correct? How far would you say you were from Mr. and Mrs. Olson? About eight, ten feet. And Mr. and Mrs. Reeves? Maybe 12. Okay, Not really so sure. You were close. You didn't have any difficulty hearing what was being said between Mr. Reeves and Mr. Olson, correct? Mr. Reed, uh, Mr. Olson, yes, I can hear him really good. Okay. Mr. Mr. Sorry. Mr. Olson, I can hear really good. Mr. Reeves, I heard him saying stuff, but I cannot hear the exact word. <coughs> At that point, okay. from that point, he's standing up. That's when pretty much stuff. After the shot rang out, um, isn't it true you observed Mrs. Olson holding her hand? Yes. Did you realize that she had been shot as well? Um. Yeah. Okay. More like she's been injured. I'm not okay. She's been shot in the hand, correct? Yes. You never saw Mr. Olson throw a cell phone at Mr. Reeves, did you? No, I did not. It didn't happen, did it? I didn't see one. You didn't see it, right? No. And you had stood up and you were looking directly at them, right? Yeah. After the events that you testified to happened, what did you do? Where did you go? I walked over where Mr. Olson collapsed. I was still in my row. I see him laying there. Um, some gentleman I saw come behind me, okay. going over seats, trying to get there. Uh, there was the two gentlemen that there then eventually somebody came in, I'm not sure it was management, asked somebody to go open the back door for the ambulance, and that's where I went to. <clears throat> While you were standing there, you were able to see Mr. Reeves, weren't you? Yes. In fact, he wasn't doing anything, he was just sitting in his chair, wasn't he? Yes. Didn't see any injuries on him, did you? No, didn't see anything. Wasn't bleeding, right?
Mr. Wolf. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions. Thank you. Ray Durant. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Wolf. Hello, sir. Um, remember that deposition we talked about earlier? Yes, sir. You came in and swore to tell the truth? Yes, sir. A hundred percent accurate? Yes, sir. Now, that happened um, in March of 2015. Do you remember that? Yeah, it was the day after my dad's birthday. Okay. So it was, a, it was a little more than a year, would you agree, after um, The Lone Survivor, the movie that you were talking yes. about? Yes. So would you agree or disagree with me that your memory was fresher then? Yes. Okay. And would you agree or disagree with me that you never told me that you heard Mr. Reeves say anything then? Judge, I'm going to object to the form of the question, and I'd ask counsel to refer to the line and page that he is uh, I'm asking referring to in the deposition. And I, I don't... Is this impeachment or what is this? Where are we going with this? Your Honor, I'm, I'm questioning him on the redirect. I'm just asking him if he remembers and we can see if he has memory of it or not. I still what though, Judge. I mean, well, if you let me ask, if, if the prosecutor lets me ask the question, we, we'll find out what. All right, finish the question. Thank you, Judge. <coughs> And do you, do you remember whether or not you told me that Mr. Reeve said anything? Yes, I did. Okay. And you told me that you couldn't hear Mr. Reeves, right? Yes. Okay. I do not object to the leading nature of these questions. Now, we can agree, do you agree or disagree with me that um, you can't you don't know any words that Mr. Reeves said. Does he object to leading? Just because he prefaces it with, do you agree or disagree, and then he tells him? Your Honor, this is the same prosecutor yesterday said that he can ask a question that's not leading if it just asks for a yes or no answer. So agree or disagree might be a little more stylistic way of asking a question that begs a yes or no. So I, I agreed with, with, with the prosecutor yesterday. I don't think I agree with him this morning on this particular point. Say the question again. All right. I wish I could remember it, Judge. Give me a second, please. Okay. May I confirm maybe my co-counsel remembers? <laughs> <laughs> You said that um, you testified uh, to the prosecutor, answering his uh, questions, that Mr. Reeves was rude. Can you point to one single word? You're saying you don't remember any words. Tell me a word that Mr. Reeves said that made you say he was rude. Is there, are there any? I don't even put the phone away. Okay. But you, what is rude about put the phone away? No proof, no previous going on. Everybody's talking. I mean, that first take thing is going on. People can't quick start out a preview. All right, but were there any cuss words or any kind of? No. So, if I understand you right, you're saying it was rude because the request was made before the previews came on. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you, Judge. <laughs> Mr. Wolf, you would agree with me it was the manner in which Mr. Reeves told Mr. Olson to put the phone away, correct? Yes. Judge, that it was rude. That's what yes. he asked and answered. Judge, he went into this on redirect. I'm entitled to go into it again. Judge, now we're getting to now we're getting into this whole harassment thing again. The, the witness answered the question that he couldn't point to anything, that he thought it was rude because of the timing of the request. And so now, we're, now the prosecutor is attempting to harass this witness and bully him into getting him to say something he wants him to say. Judge, I am going to object to Mr. Michael's characterizations of the prosecutor bullying this witness 
I'd let the record reflect, Judge. I haven't bullied this witness. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my cross-examination. He doesn't like the answers that he's getting. All right. Um, I'm going to overall, you did go into that very um, subject. Uh, the prosecutor filed <laughs> two costs on that. Um, and there, I do not find that he's bullying or harassing. Um, he is talking in a loud voice. Mr. Wolf. You would agree with me when you told Mr. Michaels that he told him to put the phone away, correct? Yes. It was the manner in which Mr. Reeves was talking to Mr. Olson that you thought was rude, right? Yes. And in fact, you said it was in a commanding voice, like telling him, Mr. Olson, put the phone away, correct? Yes. I have no further questions. Anything further? <clears throat> I know this seems, this must seem tedious to you, Mr. Wolf, but my problem is that, frankly, you've given the same answer Because I'm going to object to what his problem is in editorializing this in front of the witness. He needs to ask a question. He's allowed to sum up what he's getting at. He's been doing, everyone's been doing that, so I'm not going to. Yeah. But he's putting himself in <coughs> my problem. Rephrase. Can you point to anything that Mr. Reeves did that we, can all, ask and answer. that we can all look at and say he is rude? Objection, ask and answer. Um, he, already, he already answered that, Judge. Well, uh, Your Honor, frankly, the problem we have here is, you know, whoever goes last is going to get whatever answer they want from, from this it witness, it seems like. It has been asked and answered. And you still have all the questions on, on, on cross and recross, Judge. Correct. Okay, well, at, at this point, I'll, I'll leave it at the, the ping pong match it appears to be, and I'll sit down, Judge. No further Thank you. Um, I believe we're done with this witness. Yes, May he be uh, released, or is he still on, under subpoena? I believe he's still under subpoena, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Wolf, you're free to go today. Uh, you are still under subpoena, which means you could possibly be recalled at some point. I'm assuming the attorneys have your cell phone number. Please, if they request you to come back, they'll give you certainly time to uh, get back in, in, in a yes. e efficient manner. But um, you just make sure you answer the call should it My work going to something okay. where I get a copy of the paperwork. Very good. Unfortunately, the IHOP is not too far away. So. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wolf. <coughs> Who's next? Uh, the defense would call uh, Ms. Abru, Narita Abru. Good morning, Ms. Abreu. Good morning. How are you doing today? I'm okay. Would you please state your full name for the record? My name is Merida Abreu. Okay, and, and where do you reside? You don't have to give me the physical address, but do you reside? In Lando Lakes. In Lando Lakes. Yes. And uh, do you have an occupation or are you retired? I'm retired. Okay, and what was your previous occupation before retirement? Uh, it's like a customer service. Okay, and how long did you do customer service? On and off. 
15 years. Okay. Uh, when did you retire? Uh, 2004. Okay. Mr. Brewer, I'm going to uh, take you to January the 13th of 2014 uh, and ask you if you went to the Cobb Theater that day to see the lone survivor. Yes, I did. Okay. And did you go by yourself or did you go with others? No, I had two friends. Okay. Do you know about what time you got uh, to the Cobb Theater? Uh, it must have been like maybe 12.30, quarter to one. Did you get to the Cobb Theater before or after the preview started playing? No, oh, before. Before. Okay. Yeah. And so you get to the Cobb Theater with your friends. What do you do? We're talking with each other and, and listen, looking at the uh, previews. So you all go into Theater 10? Yeah. All together. Yeah. Would you tell the court exactly where you believe you were seated? And, and let's picture, let's picture that uh, that wall right there is the very back of the theater. And that wall right there is the screen of the movie theater. Mm -hmm. So describe to the court, if you can, where you remember uh, being seated. Okay, as you're coming up the stairs, maybe the third or fourth row. Okay. Right in the middle. Right in the middle. Yeah. Okay, and you all sat together. Yes. So you're there. Previews have not started. Is that correct? No, they were going on. The previews? So much, yeah, because okay. there were so many of them. Okay, so when you I came in, the previews were going? I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Well, if not music, I don't remember right now. Do you remember there being a wall behind you? Yes. Okay. Now, uh, when the preview started, was the theater dark or light? Uh, it was. It was lighter. It was like a dimmish. It had dimmed down, but you could still see light. So the lights had dimmed down some more. Yeah. Okay. And the previews uh, were they loud? Pretty loud. Yes. And do you remember what type of previews were on? Uh, most of them were action, uh, mo uh, you know, uh, movies that were co coming on. Shoot them up? Yeah, they were very loud. Okay. Before you saw those previews come on, did you, you remember seeing the announcement on the screen about cell phones? Yes. yes. Okay. You tell the court what you remember the announcement saying. Oh, to make sure that you put off your cell phones. Okay. And did you do that? Yeah. Okay. Your group do that? Yeah. Was that announcement pretty clear to everyone? Well, it was to me okay. and my friends. Now, you're there watching the previews with your friends. Tell me what happens. We're watching and we're still talking to one another very quietly and looking at the previews and mentioning maybe we're going to go see that movie, maybe not making plans. And then I heard... Um, Objection hearsay. Not offered for the truth of the matter asserted, number one. It is offered for the truth of the matter asserted. It's not. And I can tell you why. Uh, I can tell you what the word is and excuse my language. The word is motherfucker. And so it is not being offered for the truth of that particular statement. In fact, that is really not a statement. It's a phrase. It's an expression. Judge, it's... <clears throat> excuse me, it's an assertion, Judge, and I would rely on the case that I previously cited yesterday. It's not an excited utterance. It's not a spontaneous statement. And the other problem that we have is Ms. Abreu can't identify the declarant the one that made that statement. Therefore, it's not relevant. Judge, I don't think we need to go to Hargrove, but if you like, I studied Hargrove. And so I can have a lengthy argument on Hargrove today because Hargrove didn't apply yesterday and Hargrove doesn't apply today either. And I, I've dissected that particular case and I'll be more than glad to do it. Hargrove is a foundation case. What the court found there was that uh, the attorneys failed to lay a foundation in order to be able to uh, give some confidence in the, uh, in the declarant statement. But this is not a hearsay. This is not a statement like uh, it was yesterday. I would agree that yesterday's statement, okay, would have been a hearsay statement. And so we, we would have had to have carved that out into an excited utterance or a spontaneous statement. This is a phrase. And if the court remembers, one of the things that's very important, because they tend to forget this, we have already introduced a plethora of evidence, including Mrs. Reeves saying that Mr. Olson was using that F word 
repeatedly. Now we've got, okay, the gentleman that just uh, left the, the, the stand here, which is Mr. Wolf, that said that he remembered, you know, that F word as well. And so those are particular statements that are going to be important circumstantially in order for the court to assess the actual fear that Mr. Reeves had and the aggression that was being exerted towards Mr. Reeves. And this lady was far down and during the loud previews heard the words, motherfucker. And she's going to tell you how she felt three rows down. Judge, what I it made her feel. May I respond, please? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we do not know who the declarant was, Judge. It does not become relevant unless and until we know who the declarant was. And with all due respect to the court, I need to give you an example. And obviously I'm going to use those words, so no, no disrespect to the court, and I don't, I don't mean to offend anyone, but because we don't know who said it, it could have been a patron judge that's sitting there, there's commotion going on behind them or wherever, and they sit, actually shout out or say, mother fuck, you know, can you all shut up or take this somewhere else? So without knowing who the declarant is, it does not become relevant. But it could have been a patron for all we know. They can't attribute it to Mr. Reed. They can't attribute it to Mr. Olson. The case is clear, Judge. I stand by that case, and I'd, I'd ask this court to stand by your ruling. It, it's not, it's, there's no exceptions to the hearsay. It's not a, a, a question about foundation. Judge, uh, there's two parts to this. If you find today that the words motherfucker is hearsay, then I'll go to the next one, but it is not hearsay. It is not being offered for the truth of motherfucker. It's being offered for the effect that it was having in that particular theater at a very, very trying time. And right after that word, there was, and she's going to testify to this, a bang. Right after that word, there was a bang. What did Mrs. Reeves say? What did this gentleman here say about what was happening between Mr. Olson being aggressive towards Mr. Reeves at that very moment? How in the world can we not have such a statement? <coughs> Mr. Mr. Garcia thinks that everything has to be direct evidence, but circumstantial evidence concerning what is taking place in that theater <coughs> is very relevant. Now, if you're going to say that that is hearsay, I'll be more than glad to, har to argue Hargroves because I have dissected and I feel very comfortable that the ruling in that particular case was strictly because the lawyers in that case had not set the setting. Uh, it, and you read the case as well, and I, I know you've studied it as well, but I, I would like an opportunity. If you're going to find that this, these two words are hearsay, then I can start arguing hard work. All right. And as always, hearsay is one of the most hotly contested issues in the justice system. Um, we can all have training on it for decades and still argue about it. I don't find that the words uttered were to somehow prove that someone was really a mother effer. Um, but I do find that it, it's being offered to prove the ultimate uh, allegation that defense is trying to prove that um, there was some extreme hostility being put forth. So um, I do find it's hearsay. And we can argue hard for it. And, and, and Judge, just to, just to make a, a, a mention for the record, if, if the court's rationale, you just said, I'm not finding, okay, that they're trying to prove the words motherfucker, it's for the effect, then it's not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Because if it's only effect, it is not hearsay. By very definition, it is not hearsay when you're trying to introduce that statement for the effect. I agree that if for some reason we were litigating something and I had to prove, you know, that that person uh, had to show the words, then I'd be in a different situation. I'd be back to hard work. But when you're using it for the effect on someone else, then it's no longer being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. And so that's the truth of the matter asserted, it, its effect, is what we're trying to show. 
And that word has been said by that word has been said here by many people. I mean, it's not like this is the only, you know, F word that we've heard in this entire hearing. So I just want to make that for the record and make that perfectly clear that I think that even by the court's definition, we would be allowed to do this. Judge, may I respond briefly? Yes. Again, they cannot set the, the scene in this. They don't know who the declarant is. And then the other question is, it has to be the effect on the hearer or the listener. Who is the listener? They can't establish that. It can't be Miss Abreu. So therefore, it's not relevant, Judge. All right, which of course, we all know, if the argument is that it's not offered uh, to prove the truth asserted, then what's it being offered for? The effect of someone in a theater saying, and I'm going to say it loud so you can, she was way down there, motherfucker, that's going to affect people. It's going to affect her, and it did, and she'll testify to that. It's going to affect him. It's going to affect everybody in that theater because you know what? That doesn't happen in a theater. When we go to the theater, it is a time for peace and quiet. It is a time of being able to have that movie showing and you feel like you're in the moment. So that is what we're trying to show. It's the effect. And so it's no surprise to the prosecution, because they've heard this time and time again, that that word, fuck, 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 was being said by Olson, even by Mr. Wolf, which was the latest witness here. But it, it's clear. It has to be the effect on the listener. If, assume this example, if it was Mr. Olson who had turned to Mr. Reeves and said, motherfucker, then you have a declarant, you have the person that's hearing it, which would be Mr. Reeves. That's the effect on the listener. It has to be on Mr. Reeves, not Miss Abreu, not on the patrons in the theater. They haven't met their burden. They haven't set up the scene, like I said, Judge, and I'm not going to repeat it over and over again. They don't know who the declarant is. They don't know who the listener is, and therefore, it's not admissible. And I ask that you stand by your ruling, stand by the case. It's clear. It's inadmissible. Judge, we're not at the case yet. We're still at the definition of whether I'm, I'm introducing that for the truth of the matter asserted. If, in fact, the court finds that it's hearsay, then I'll move on to Hargrove, and I'll be more than glad to explain Hargrove. But listen, the one thing that we've got to know, and he knows this, the Hargrove court didn't say, if we don't know who the declarant is, we can't get it in. You don't see that anywhere in that particular opinion. That's not the holding. And how we read cases is certainly not by footnotes. I saw uh, Mr. Garcia yesterday referring to a footnote. We don't read cases by footnotes. We read cases by the body of the case and the holding of the case and the reasoning behind those particular issues. And so I'll get to Hargrove if the court first rules whether that statement, motherfucker, uh, if, if it's hearsay. And the only way it can be hearsay, Your Honor, is that I was using that word to prove the truth of the matter asserted, those two words, and I'm not. I'm using it for the effect. Then I'm assuming if someone had shouted Merry Christmas, you think it, you'd have the same argument? If this was in a bar and you know it was a joyous time for Christmas, I'd have a problem. I'd be honest with you, I'd have a problem. But you've got to take the setting. In fact, one of the things that this court in Hardware talks about is any time that a statement is being introduced, you've got to view the setting and the circumstances that were taking place at the time that the statement was made. Because if we don't allow statements like this at a time, the sequence of events, the word motherfucker in the shot, it is so tied together. It wasn't like someone said motherfucker and then five minutes later you hear a shot. That's not going to be her testimony. It's going to be she heard that word and the shock came out. So it's circumstantial evidence. You know, she couldn't see who was saying motherfucker from, you know, from her seat, obviously. But it's circumstantial evidence. And just like the prosecution on many occasions uses circumstantial evidence to prove matters, so can the defense. May I respond, Judge? Yes, you can use circumstantial evidence if it is admissible. They cannot get around the fact that they cannot establish that the listener was Mr. Reeves. They can't do it, Judge. And, and the only reason why they're trying to get this statement is, is because of its inflammatory nature. 
it's not relevant if they cannot establish that Mr. Reeves heard that statement and Mr. Olson is the person that said it. And therefore, hard to apply, Judge. Whether you read Head Note 2 or you read the body of the case, if you cannot identify the declarant, it does not come in. I'm aware of the limitations of that last statement. I do find it is hearsay. And um, I'm going to stand by my ruling yesterday for various reasons. Judge Guy, can I argue Hargrove? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay. Judge, uh, first of all, when we're looking at Hargrove, we have to first have the basic premise that we have with all hearsay uh, statements and then all exceptions to the hearsay rule because an excited utterance or a spontaneous uh, statement, uh, that, those statements are excluded out of the hearsay prohibition uh, because there's a sense of reliability with those particular uh, statements. And so first of all, what we have to do is in looking at the exceptions, we've got to say, okay, were the statement itself and were the surrounding circumstances in which the statement was made, does that give the statement some indicia of reliability? And so when you're looking at this particular case, you've got to look at all the surrounding circumstances and all the surrounding evidence that this court has already heard. You've heard from Mrs. Reeves, where she has indicated and testified that Mr. Olson repeatedly uh, was using the uh, F word uh, and was extremely mad uh, at her husband. You've heard Mr. Wolf indicate that yes, he got up, he was using the you know, F word, he was turned around towards Mr. Reeves. Uh, and so one of the words that we're trying to introduce here is that same word in that same loudness in a, in a theater that Mr. Reeves was seated at. So when he's saying we've got to be able to place the listener at that scene, absolutely. He was at that scene. So let's, let's take a look at Hargrove now and how that differs. There was a fight in this case between an individual by the name of Hargrove and McNeil. Lawson was an individual that was there during that particular fight. Uh, and at the time, if the court recalls, Lawson, after the fight, uh, was walking down the sidewalk. And all of a sudden, uh, he sees uh, McNeil walking down the sidewalk. And then there's a, a shooting of Mr. McNeil. Uh, Mr. Lawson didn't see Mr. Hargrove shoot McNeil. He just knew that there was a fight and that he was walking down the sidewalk and all of a sudden this gentleman is shot. Now, the prosecution in that case wanted to get uh, in a statement that Lawson had heard from a general crowd. That general crowd was an unidentified person that had heard a statement. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about what the statement was. The statement was, Your Honor, <clears throat> Panna did come back with his shit. Now, let's talk about that particular issue. Because the court says, well, what does that mean? Uh, it could mean that, you know, Panna, which was the nickname for Hargrove, it could mean that Panna uh, was bringing back a gun or it brought back a gun or a, or a knife or they said anything. In fact, the lawyers in this particular case had failed to lay a foundation as to whether or not the people that, or the declarant, one of those people that were in that group, whether the declarant was even there before or after the shooting. I mean, that's, that's what they're talking about. They're saying, hey, listen, we don't even know, you know who the declarant is, and we don't even know, more importantly, where the declarant was when the excited utterance took place. <coughs> so they say the following, and this is, they're giving the court now some guidance. They say, the court factors to be considered when determining whether necessary state of stress or excitement is present 
you have to look at the age and the physical and mental condition of the declarant. Okay, so what have we done in an effort to lay a foundation about who we believe is the declarant in this particular case? Well, we've got testimony from Ms. Reeves to show that at and before the time of the actual shot, there was an individual, Mr. Olson, that was yelling profanities, was extremely outraged and mad at Mr. Reeves, and that he used that word on numerous occasions. And that right after the use of that F word, there was a shot. That's one witness. So now, second witness, Mr. Wolf. What does he say? Very similar in that Mr. Olson was up, he was really mad, he was using F words, okay, and that after that process took place, what happened? A shot. Now, the court is asking us at this point in time that we've got to set those circumstances. The court in Hargrove not once said, you can't introduce a statement of a declarant that you don't know who they are. Because the court realizes that there are statements out there circumstantially that are very, very important to prove fear that Mr. Reeves was, was feeling. And remember, we've got to step in the shoes of Mr. Reeves. And so if we don't allow that sort of evidence in a case like this, how can we step in the shoes of Mr. Reeves? Because we know that Mr. Reeves was there in that theater experiencing through two independent witnesses that F1. And so the court says here, there was no showing that the statement was made while the defendant was perceiving the event because they didn't lay the circumstances of that. Or immediately thereafter, while under stress and excitement caused by the event. We know, even by Miss Olson, that she says, my husband was mad. Got three witnesses now that are laying the foundation under Harvard. It's very, very clear, Your Honor, that what they did in Hargrove was they failed to lay the foundation. And it's right in the body of the opinion. There was no showing. That's how the court starts with deciding this particular case. There was no showing. Moreover, moreover, it was not established that the statement was made while the declarant was perceiving the event or immediately thereafter. We've shown that by other witnesses concerning the use of those F words or while under the stress and excitement of the event. Because, and this is the most important, because the record fails to support the statement's admissibility as a spontaneous or an excited utterance, we find that the trial court Erred in this case, the trial court had allowed that in, in admitting that particular piece of evidence. We're in a different ball game here. Uh, we were in a different ball game, and I say this respectfully, Your Honor. I, I know that, and you're right. Hearsay is a is a is a problem that we all deal with time and time again. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, and even before yesterday, we made it a point to make sure that we were laying proper foundations for everything that was coming in here. We've laid the proper foundation for this witness. Uh, we've laid the proper foundation for yesterday. And we were prepared not to argue yesterday, but we're going to come back with a memorandum of law, not only with Hargrove, but we intend to come back with a memorandum of law of cases in other states that have applied that same situation, just so that at least you know we have a record and an opportunity for the court to maybe reflect uh, on your decision yesterday and hopefully uh, you know, consider you know, our argument. But for today, this is my argument and, uh, and I think that we're on solid foundation. I, I mean that respectfully. May I respond? Briefly. I'm going to respond briefly. As I indicated to the court, the problem Mr. Escobar has, he indicated in the case that says that you have to consider the age and the mental condition of the declarer. Their problem is they cannot establish who the declarant is. And through his analysis and through the fault in that analysis, what he's using is leaps of faith in the evidence. 
What he's saying is Mr. Wolf said that Chad Olson was cussing. Therefore, if he was cussing, it must have been him that said motherfucker. Then he goes to Mrs. Reeves. Mrs. Reeves says Chad Olson was cussing. Therefore, it must have been Chad that said motherfucker. Then he uses Mrs. Olson. Mrs. Olson says Chad was angry. Oh, well, therefore, it had to have been Chad that said motherfucker. Let me give you this example, Judge. What if it was Mr. Olson that was in the theater, and, he's, and nobody knows, just like he had said, that it's a general crowd and the person is unidentified, right? So in this example, Mr. Olson is in there and he's the one that makes a statement, oh my God, don't shoot me. And he can't, nobody can identify and say, it was Mr. Olson that made that statement. Under his theory, that would come in. It's no different, Judge. The case law is clear. We have argued this to the point we can't argue it anymore, Judge. You've made your decision. I'd ask that you stand by your ruling. It's a sound ruling. I'd ask that you not allow the statement in. The difference between the other two who said he was cussing, and I might add, none of them said he said motherfucker. So they were looking at him. They identified him. He's the one that said that. In this case, there's no indication that she had any idea who it might be. And I know, obviously, as Mr. Garcia pointed out, you want me to infer that. And I'm declining to do so because the, there could just as easily have been another person tired of hearing the bickering. I don't know. No one's asked, did anyone else say, was anyone else around them cussing? I don't know that. And I, I can't make that leap that because Mrs. Olson said he said a cuss word and Mr. Wolf said he said he's a cuss word. Um, that automatically it's inferred to be Mr. Olson. So, and as in my ruling yesterday, once again, um, the, the highest consideration that I have to make a ruling on is, is the indicia of reliability. And because of my doubts that I've already indicated, that is my number one concern, and that is the reason for the hearsay rules, the underlying reason. And because of that, I am concerned about the reliability of, of that statement based on no identification of the declarant. So that's why I'm ruling once again in the same fashion. Um, and my ruling of yesterday stands. And as I recall, whatever the statement that witness said did not coincide with anything anyone else had said. So, um, for the same reasons, I'm going to uh, decline to allow that. Judge, I can I ask one question on your ruling? Uh, is the court uh, ruling that uh, with an unidentified declarant that uh, you would never be able to have an excited utterance or a spontaneous statement? I just want to make sure that I I, no. I didn't hear that from you, no. but but so this no. is this is just based upon these facts. Yes, okay. based upon these facts. I'm I understand the the ruling in Hargrove and the the analysis that was done, and in this case, um, I don't find it to be appropriate under these facts for those reasons, primarily. Uh, my concern about the reliability of the statement. So, um, Judge, I, I hope you uh, realize that, uh, and, and we, we're going to have to proffer it, obviously. I understand. I hope you appreciate that. Oh, I think it's been said plenty, so one more time, maybe we're going to hurt. Okay. <laughs> Thank Go you. Go right ahead. Okay. And proffer. <laughs> Mr. Brew, uh, I know you've heard a lot of this. Let's get back to your testimony. Uh, you're watching the previews, the previews are loud. And you hear what? I heard the word used, motherfucker. You gotta say it a little louder. I heard the word used was motherfucker. Okay, how did it make you feel? 
Well, at that point, I felt like someone was mad. And um, I didn't have much more time to think about any, anything else because then I heard, I heard the shot. Right here. Yes. Were those words coming from the previous? I'm sorry? Were those words coming from the previous? Oh, no, no. Were those words coming from anyone there in front of you? No. Not that I know. I mean, it was just, it's not in our crowd that we were three of us and everybody else, there's nobody else next to us, so. What did you feel those words were? Fighting words? They were, someone was mad. Have you ever said that those words were fighting words to you? Uh, I, I guess so. That someone was mad, so, you know, I don't know. I, I didn't have time, any more time to think about anything else. I just thought, you know, it was a problem word. Judge, that is my proffer. Thank you. <clears throat> What did you do then? Well, we got up and we left the, uh, the theater. Okay. And uh, did you see anyone in the back of the theater as you were getting up or leaving? I just happened to look back and I saw someone. Um, it looked like a man just sitting back at the chair. Young or old? I couldn't. I can't remember. I don't. I don't know. I just saw someone. Okay. Very back row? Yes. Where did you go? We went down to the lobby of the theater. Okay. Is that uh, called the concession area? Right, yes. Okay. And what did you do there? Um, we sat down on these tables that they had. They told us to sit down. Uh, these were people that were coming from the uh, Theater 10? <coughs> the, uh, the group, yes. Yeah. yes. And so people were coming out of Theater 10, they were putting them there at the concession area? Right. Tell the court how many people we saw in that area. Uh, it was quite a few people. I wouldn't say a you know, big, big crowd, but there were a few people there. Everybody sitting at tables? Yes. Were people talking? Yeah, I would say so. Were they talking about what they had witnessed inside the theater? Some were, yeah, I guess so. And those conversations took place 15 to 20 minutes before the police got there? About, yes. And then when the police got there, did anybody come to you and say, Junction is the leading judge. Did, you, did any police officer come to you and tell you not to talk or not to discuss your, your uh, observations in the theater with anybody else? I don't recall. You don't recall any officer coming to you and telling you that? No. You were there for how long? Please tell the court how long you were there in that concession stand with that group of people. I mean, the total before we left to yeah. go home? Yeah. Hours, right? Yeah. Yes. Two and a half hours? About, yes. And throughout all that time, people were talking. Right? I guess so. And throughout two and a half hours, no police officer came to you and told you not to discuss things with anybody else, right? No, I don't recall. Did you recall any police officer coming to anyone in that group and saying, hey guys, please don't talk about anything? I was too nervous to <laughs> look at anyone else or I was just nervous. I got up and I was and on the phone with my daughter. I wasn't really paying attention to uh, anyone else. You filled out your form right there in that concession area, did you not? Yes. Your statement form. Yes. Right in the same table with everybody else around you, right? The is the leading judge. He's been leading for the last five minutes. Uh, I'll rephrase that one, Mr. Garcia. Thank you. Where did you fill out your statement form? Well, we were sitting on the table. How many people were sitting at the table when you were filling out that form? Just my friends. No further 
questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Ross? 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 And just so the record is clear, the questions that he had previously asked in reference to the statement, that was for a profit and a profit only. Correct. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> Mr. Brew, uh, well, it's still morning. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. You would agree with me, would you not, Ms. Grew, this was a traumatic experience for you? Very much so, It upset yes. you, right? Yes. Now, Mr. Escobar is asking you about people and where they were sitting and that you all were sitting at a table, and he asked you, were people talking, right? Yes. Is it fair to say, and I'm asking you, with your own independent recollection, do you remember people talking? People were talking, yes. Okay. Is it fair to say that you do not know what they were talking about? In a way, yes. Yes, I just heard them talking. I didn't, you know, it wasn't part of my, they weren't talking to me. So right. I didn't know the conversation, what they were talking about directly. So when he asked you they were talking about what had happened in the theater, you don't know that for a fact, do you? Right. They could have been talking about the weather for all you know, right? Yes. Yes, you have no idea what they were talking about, correct? All right, yes. And you indicated that you don't recall the police saying not to talk about the incident, correct? Yes. Now, are you saying that they didn't? That no, they, I, I didn't record. I didn't. I don't recall. You don't remember. So right. they could have said, "Hey, folks, please don't talk about the incident." You just don't remember, do you? Right. Yes. <coughs> and you said you were nervous when you were sitting at the table, correct? Very, yes. Now, you wouldn't have discussed what you saw or heard with your friends, would you? No, we were just concerned. We were concerned about the amount of time that the police appeared, so we figured that the ambulance usually comes with the police, so we were concern about the person. Okay. You you were for the record, you were concerned for the person that was shot, Mr. Yes. yes. Okay. So you were talking about that, the, the response time for the paramedics of the ambulance. Right. But yes. not about the events that had transpired in the, in the theater. All three of us got up and we got on the phones with our family members, so we were on the phone with our, I was on the phone with my daughter. I don't know, my, my friends were with family members okay. that they called. So you don't agree with me that if you're on the phone with your daughter, you're really not paying attention to the folks that are sitting there and what they're doing or not doing or what they're talking about. Right. Yeah. Correct? Yes. Do you have any further questions, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Brew, did you just tell Mr. Garcia that uh, that uh, you did not hear other people in the concession stand talking about what they witnessed in the theater amongst themselves? Is that what you told Mr. Garcia? Yeah. In, a, in a way, like I said, it was a, so much commotion that I, they might have said a word or two. I don't know. I don't really remember that. I mean, it was... Remember uh, me taking a, depo a deposition of you? Yes. Okay. And that deposition was taken on January the 5th of 2015, approximately a year after uh, this particular incident. Remember that? Right, yes. And uh, you would agree with me that your recollection would be much better on January the 5th of 2015 than it is today, correct? Yes. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. Page 27, Mr. Garcia. Um, I'd like an opportunity to lines. see the page on the line. Of that oh, come right over here and I'll, I'll show it to you. <coughs> Judge, if he's trying to impeach her, I think this is improper impeachment. She said she doesn't remember. Judge, so uh, she, he needs to give her an opportunity to read this to see if it refreshes her memory prior to... Page 27, lines 25, page 28, lines 1 through 15. So we start at 27. Are people talking about what they saw? Yes. And are they sharing that information with each other? Yeah. Okay. Well, she said she doesn't remember, so you can give it to her. Yeah. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to first ask her if she made the statements. No, that's not the way it goes, Judge. She, he, she needs to be allowed an opportunity to read it, and if she says, yes, that refreshes my memory, 
then he can ask the question, but he can't go directly. Just, to the I'll, I'll do it that way, but I, you know, it's, it's, <coughs> it's, 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 I'll do that it. Triggers yeah. refreshing. This will be, I'm going to. Mm -hmm. Can I come over sure, next sure. to you, okay. Your Honor? Yes. <laughs> ask her, not you. Uh, can I put this on your sure, lap so sure. you can so you can see it? Sure. Okay. I'm going to direct you to read uh, on page 27 to yourself first. Mm -hmm. This sentence. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's my question to you. Yeah. Your answer. Yeah. Your answer. Yes. Now, does that refresh your recollection? <sighs> if I said that at that time, I guess I did say it. But I just today, I don't remember that. And you've already told the court that certainly your recollection back then would have been a little bit better. Yes, yes. And so in reading that particular segment, you agree that you said, yes, they were talking about what they had seen in the theater amongst each other. Right, yes. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. May this witness be released? This witness. I have a few follow-up questions. Okay. Mr. Green, can you tell us specifically what was said about the case? The people that were talking, what did you hear that made you believe they were talking about the case? They were talking about the, the someone got shot and um, that it was a young man. Well, I mean, that's generalities. I yeah. mean, that, well, you would agree with me, would you not, that everybody in the theater had figured well, out that's someone what was shot. That's what they were talking about. Yeah. Okay, but there was no <laughs> specifics that you heard like... I saw, you know, Mr. Reeves do this. Mm -hmm. I saw Chad Olson do that. Mm -hmm. I heard, mm -hmm. I specifically heard Mr. Olson say this or Mr. Reeves say that. Right, no. Right? No. So this was just, in general, someone was shot. And mostly talking about the, the amount of time it took the police to, you know, to come. So those were the to things respond. that we're talking about. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We're going to keep her under subpoena, Judge, but I really doubt that we're probably, we're probably not going to call her back. Thank you, Mr. Brew. Thank you. You're free to go. You're still under subpoena with the possibility that you could get recalled. So please, um, you know, respond to any phone calls that you get uh, requesting you to come back. You'll certainly have ample time to uh, make arrangements to get back if you are called back. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay. You're free to go today. Uh, it's a good time for a lunch break unless you want to continue. No. All right. Um, do we need any additional time for any reason today? Judge, sure, we could just have like an hour and 15 minutes. i got about uh, three or four witnesses that you know, are going to be coming up. And... Okay. That sounds like a good plan. Let's be back at, uh, say, 1220. I mean, 120. Uh, that'll give us an hour and 16, 18 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.